No kilt. Obviously, this being in England, if I turn up here in kilt, they're either concerned it's a stag do or an invasion. <laughs> so I thought I'd come in. in these jeans and a pair of Ugg boots because we had torrential rain uh, and I got off the train at King's Cross to find actual summer uh, which I haven't seen in about three years so um, <laughs> yeah this is it um, this talk is about change the original title for it were the the times they are a changing um, because it's been a, a very musical week for me this week with loads going on but moreover I want to start with this we are in some strange times. Oh, presenter also there. Give me six. Sorry, lady. There we go. Here we go. Some strange times indeed. Uh, this man, a TV actor, is the president of the United States of America, which is quite crazy. The, the best thing about this photo, and the reason I've chosen this one, is this looks like a sitcom. If you'd been in a coma for the last ten years and you woke up and this was on TV, you would sit down and go, "This is going to be fucking great." Right. <laughs> But everything's changing just now. What we, what we expect is not what we're getting. We are using phones to take videos. We use watches to count the steps we take, not tell the time. We use coffee shops to get Wi-Fi. We use police boxes to get coffee. People that make alcohol at home used to be called alcoholics and make illegal moonshine. Now it's a hobby and it's called home brewing and apparently it's totally acceptable. Headphones used to go into the headphone jack. Not anymore, thanks to Apple. They now go into the power jack. CDs used to have music on them, and instead we use CDs as coasters. This is, this is one of my favorite ones. Not buying a song 15 times now counts as buying the song once according to the Pepsi Max chart. How the fuck is that happening? <laughs> I stole this from Carol. 1998, don't get in a stranger's car, don't meet people from the internet. 2016, literally summon strangers from the internet to get into their car and go where they're going. But the web has changed too in these last 18 years. Since the invention of cascading style sheets, we called them cascading style sheets so that the styles should cascade. It says it in the title, except if anyone has paid attention to where CSS is going and also listened to Harry's great talk at Jab about specificity, cascading style sheets in 2017 should no longer cascade. Websites should be responsive, that's what they told us, the same markup to all devices and all services and allow them to display it as they want. And this is absolutely true, as long as you don't count Google's AMP, Apple News, or Facebook News, because they all want your markup in a slightly different way. And thankfully, Apple, Google, and Facebook are not big players on the internet scene. You should separate your logic and your presentation layer. That's how we should build websites, as long as you don't count web components or anything to do with JavaScript today, where you should bundle them all together. You should progressively enhance don't rely on JavaScript. That is the message that we've been sending out for years. But, the, but in order to be future compatible, you should not rely on JavaScript, but you should put all your HTML and CSS inside your JavaScript web component. You should use semantic HTML5, where every tag has one meaning and one meaning only, as long as you don't count in the first tag, main, because Google changed the HTML5 spec to make sure that you can have multiple mains on the one page and in fact, you can have a main inside your main and multiple of them. So you know which main is the main one and which main one is not the main one because it's the one that comes after the second main one because that's clear as shit. With all the change going on in the web, and I think it's a really positive time, as much as I might not agree with some of these changes, I see where they're coming from. I want to talk to you about the changes coming to for us as the death of the CMS. But that's quite a contentious thing to talk about. People get quite upset. People whose business models and communities are based on it don't like to hear about the death of something they love. So let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the death of CDs, because that's nice and simple. We use them as coasters. This is 
uh, a chart from the independent, uh, what's the IFPI? Uh, and it's to do with sales in America of music. And the blue line here is specifically CDs for the most part, or uh, physical um, music sales. This is a great one. So we're gonna talk about CDs only. As you can see from its real invention and output in 91, CD sales kept going up until the year 2000, and then it's tailoring off really rapidly. That isn't going to be news to anyone here. The, with the analogies I want to bring in, I want people to remember this and realize that iTunes, which was meant to be the CD killer, didn't actually come out in 2004, and yet CDs had already started to wane in terms of their sales. Spotify and streaming didn't come out until October 2008. It wasn't mainstream until 2010. And yet, the decline of CDs happened long before the thing we talk about that killed CDs. Moreover, a lot of people say that it's not the software that changed and killed CDs, but actually, it's got more to do with the hardware, the changes in behavior. It's the iPod that killed CDs. It's the iPhone that killed CDs. Well, I would suggest that none of that's true. CDs were on decline before Steve Jobs announced the iPad, before the iPhone, before the proliferation of the smartphone on the whole. CDs were already on the way down, and yet they were considered to be booming. I like to point this out. The mini disc and the Rio, the first like, commercially available MP3 player, they were all released in 98. And for rechangeable mini discs, the fact that you could get music from your computer was already there long before the iPod and the iPhone. But neither the real nor the mini disc was considered a success. Because when they came out, CD sales were still going up. I would suggest to you that the death of CDs happened somewhere around the mini disc time, somewhere around the real time but we just didn't see it because sales were still going up. But CD sales have gone down most countries in the world, with the exception of India, where they continue to grow. In the last five years, the growth in the CD market in India is almost at 150% year on year. Also, Sales of compilation albums jumped 7.2% in 2012 in comparison to where they were in 2011. While CD sales are dropping on the whole, the market share for CD sales for compilation albums is going up. The market share of where CDs are sold is huge in India in comparison to Europe. So let's talk about the, the death aspect of it a little sec. Let's talk about the death of music, the death of music sales. Digital music sales only overtook physical sales worldwide in April of last year. More vinyl, <laughs> old-fashioned vinyl, was sold in December last year in the UK than there was digital downloads in the UK last year. And that's skewed a little bit by the fact that it's Christmas time, so people were spending money on albums. But we still think of CDs and vinyl as things that are long gone. Classical music sales are still 88% physical. 95% of new cars in the US and Europe had the CD player installed as standard. In the US, Ford and Lexus still installed cassette tape players as standard in all their trucks until 2011. The idea that something is dead and therefore it is gone is completely wrong. What I want to do with the music analogy here is show you that something can be dead and be dying, yet still look like it's thriving, still look like things are moving forward for based from where it is from its point of view. So let me bring you to Schrodinger's CMS. I was going to talk about Joomla, um, and then I thought that that might upset people, it might get into big conversations, because I think there's a huge, huge opportunity for Joomla. So instead, I'm going to talk about Drupal. <laughs> Is there any Drupal users here? 
One, right, two, fantastic. All right, brilliant. I'm going to start asking you boys questions. All right. So the death of the CMS of Drupal. In 2012, Rangers Football Club, as we know it, died. In 2017, the Undertaker gimmick has died. I don't know when Drupal is going to die, but Drupal is A, dying, and B, it is already dead, in my opinion, in the same way CDs are already dead, even though we use them. The thing about Drupal is that Drupal has made a really, really smart decision in that it knows it's dead. It knows it has no long-term future. Drupal is the CD of the CMS world. But what it has done, and what's very smart, and what I want to talk to you guys about, is the fact that while it knows the CMS market, as it knows it, is plummeting and dying soon, and that soon might be two years, five years, 10 years, Drupal has doubled down on where it considers the India to be, where it considers the compilation albums to be. Drupal is targeting enterprises and governments, specifically governments just now, of which you'll be glad to hear there's less than 300. That's a really, really small market. But in the last two years, Drupal's market share has gone up incredibly. Since Drupal, through Acquia, won the contract to make the Australian government website and all Australian government services, it has become the de facto go-to for CMSs for governments. Now, that's a really small market. They've narrowed down, but they've realized that they're the India of it. They're going to own a whole bunch of that. They've also turned around and looked at the enterprises, they looked at the FTSE, FTSE 500, and they realized that 50% of companies in the FTSE 500 weren't around 20 years ago. But the number of companies that are older than 20 years, that are on the FTSE 500, they do not understand digital, they don't get it. They are a dying breed, and they are desperate to find a content management system that is monolithic in nature because these guys still like things to run like the 80s, yet just modern enough that it will survive the next five years and it has a huge ecosystem of well-paid consultants that will tell them everything's okay and keep it going. And that is Drupal. I'm not being negative about Drupal here. Drupal have seen that the way the web is going, that the current viewpoint of a CMS isn't going to be here in five years, maybe. Might not definitely be here in 10 years. I think as we consider a CMS, I think it's already dead. I think it's CDs for music. But that's not to say there's not money to be made for it. That's not to say there's not problems to solve. That's not to say there's not a market. Drupal is both dying and yet at the same time thriving because it knows the market it's in and it's cornering it really, really well. And here's how it's doing that. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. This is from Simon Sinek's book, um, Start With Why. What Drupal does really well is it describes the why of, you, of why you should use it as a CMS. It doesn't target everyone. It doesn't pretend to be a CMS for everyone. It doesn't pretend to solve problems for everyone. Drupal has turned around and said, why should you use us? Because you're an enterprise or a huge organization, because you need to have backups, you need to be on the cloud, you need to meet certain regulations. You need to work with companies of a particular size so that you can get the service level agreements that you want. Drupal is very clear in its why you should use it and also why you shouldn't use it. I wouldn't consider using Drupal for a blog. I would consider using it if my project was going to be more than four or five million dollars. Tell you another CMS that has their why pretty damn good. It's actually the very first thing on their homepage. WordPress. WordPress has it right at the top of the homepage. WordPress is designed to democratize publishing. And then if you click on that link, it says WordPress, you should use WordPress if you want to have your simple website. Now, they've updated that text over the time, but the why for WordPress, right at the top. Well, so what you'll find is 
much like the CD sales. WordPress is going to do this, and it'll come back down. Its market share is going to drop at some stage. That's okay, because the why to use WordPress is there. CMSs, as we know it, are going to have an incredibly challenging time over the next five years, not just dealing with the rate of change in technology, but also the rate of change in our user expectations, what the business needs are going to be. And my question to you guys here in the Joomla Day UK is, what's Joomla's why? Why should someone use Joomla? And I mean that in a, in a positive way. You guys all have great stories and great, you use it for great reasons. But mostly when I wander around these conferences and go, well, why should I use Joomla? You guys tell me, well, it's not WordPress and Drupal. And as funny as that is, out there, that doesn't mean that many things. I need to know what your guys' why is because the CMS as we know it is going to die, it's going to evolve. And WordPress has picked their path and Drupal has picked their path. And October CMS and Squiz and everyone else has picked their path. And I don't know what your guys' path is. Sure as hell not the first thing on your website. So if the CMS is going to die, I don't want you guys to die with it. Story time. Because I totally appreciate that that last bit ended on a bit of a downer. <laughs> and I do get that. And I know that everyone's kind of sleepy from lunch, but it's, it's a message that I've been trying to, to articulate and get across for ages. But this story will help. Actually, I, I have a real fear over this story. This story is going to be about uh, my little niece called Hannah Bridget. Um, and the last time she saw me doing it, um, so it's a story of when she was about four or five, and she's now 12. Um, and she's told me that when she gets to 18, she's going to sue me for royalties for the number of times I tell this story. So uh, it's going to happen less and less. When Hannah was five, she came to my house, and I have a little side office in it, and she was playing at secretary. She loves typing and banging away and, and answering the phone and all the rest of it. Um, and what she did was, she went in at the computer, next to the fax machine, all the rest of it. I said, I'm going to phone the landline uh, from out here, and I'm going to make an appointment with you. She's like, great, she's playing doctors, whatever. So I've gone outside, I've closed the door, which is a little glass door, around the corner in the hallway, and I phoned it, and she picks up the phone, and I said, hello, I'd like to make an appointment, in silence. And I don't know how many of you have children, but uh, if there's a four-year-old in the house and it's silent, it's scary right, because you don't know what they're doing. Anyway, I go in into the room because I can kind of hear something, and she's not speaking on the phone. I said, well, Hannah, what's wrong? And she said, I'm, I'm not going to steal your phone. I'm not like that. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I, why would I think you're trying to steal the phone? And she holds up the phone with the cable attached to the fax machine. She could not comprehend the idea that there was a wire attached for any other reason than to stop the four-year-old hiding the phone down the side of the couch where she used to hide the TV remote controls. Her brain couldn't understand it because, she, not just because she'd never seen it before, but because it's so alien and old-fashioned, her brain had never encountered that type of thinking. Yet, I hadn't thought of that at all. I thought she would just go phone and she wouldn't even see it even if I'd have thought of it at the time. The reason I tell this story is because we view the world from a certain viewpoint. We're mostly techie here. I mean, the two Drupal guys, they've got to be fucking techie, right? <laughs> but we're mostly techie, right? Even if we're designers and we're not the hard code guys, right? We see our view, our world from our viewpoint. We're also roughly about the same age, apart from George. But, but that is a, a, a truth of the Joomla community. We don't get so many of the 17, 18 year old open source guys that are running around main, making React apps, right? We also don't get a lot of the, you know, Solzman types. They're, they're hanging out with these two at Drupal, right? We, we have a certain age group that Joomla attracts. We have a certain um, viewpoint that Joomla attracts. It's not the hardcore and it's not the super creative we're nicely in the middle, but that is our viewpoint and our worldview is formed by that as a community. 
But that is unlikely to be the viewpoint of the people younger than us or older than us. We're making decisions in the CMS world, in the web world, about what we think is going to be right for people when we have no idea in the world, either A, what is right for them, or B, what's going to be right for them in five, 10 years. It's not just the case that, okay, so phones no longer have a cable and they're now mobile, that's cool. It's about if someone goes back to use that, what do they think of it? Do they think it's there to stop them? Is it a negative rather than something that we think they just come to ignore? I raise these points because as much as we have to talk about tech in the community in the next six months, and as much as we're looking forward to Joomla 4 and Joomla X, what the next versions are, we need to have conversations around long-term support. Why is it even a thing? We need to have conversations around updates and how they happen. And Brian made some great points today. We have to realize that people who are older than us and non-techie hate the idea of updates because updates is brand new in the world. When, your video, when you bought a video player, when you bought a car, when you bought a house, you didn't need to update it. You just bought something and it worked till it broke and then you bought a new one. And it's been like that in the world since humans started crawling, with the slight exception of 20 years ago, we went, hey, we can update things. It's brand new to people, they don't get it. Because it doesn't happen in any other facet of human life. You're not sitting eating at a restaurant and someone comes along with half a steak and goes, this is a slightly better steak. Versioning, we like the idea of versions. And you can see some communities, WordPress is a great example, where they only support one. Older people like the idea of versions because they can understand I've gone from this to this to this. I've gone from my eight track to my tape to my CD player. That is a linear progression and I completely understand it. Whereas younger people have no concept of versioning. They don't, they don't care what version of Facebook or Instagram they're on. They are just on Facebook or Instagram. There's a reason so many people didn't upgrade from Internet Explorer 6. And Google instead made the decision with Chrome purely to have automatic updates. We need to have conversations about what decisions we're making in Joomla and on the web on the whole, and how that impacts people that are younger than us, older than us, and what their expectations are now, and what they're going to be in five years. Because if you build Joomla 4 for what you need now, if you build Joomla X based on what you need now, by the time it is released, it is already old. So ending on the little musical note from um, the Bob Dylan song, which I, I love this final chorus of it. The line that is drawn, the curse that is cast, the slow one now will later be fast. As the present now will later be past, the CMS order is rapidly fading. And the first one now will later be last, for the times they are a-changing. My message to you guys in a positive way is that you'd better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. Thank you very much. <laughs>